So uh, my name is Michael Caprola, and uh, I will talk about streaming algorithms. So uh, streaming algorithms, namely, these are algorithms for processing massive data sets using a small amount of memory. OK, so the plan for the next three lectures, or at least the tentative plan, is as follows. So we'll first start with the basics of uh, streaming. So in particular, we will look at streaming algorithms that have been known since the 90s, and this is the first lecture, and then uh, slowly we'll delve into the 2000s. These will be streaming algorithms for answering basic statistical queries on huge data sets, such as finding the number of distinct elements in a large database of items, <coughs> or finding frequency moments, I'll define this uh, shortly, heavy hitters, namely you have a huge database of items, you want to figure out which ones occur most frequently and that database. And uh, later, in lectures three and four, we'll move towards the very exciting recent development in streaming algorithms. This will be on graph sketching. So in particular, in the third and fourth lecture, we will talk about how one can apply these basic statistical primitives that we develop in lecture one and two to problems in graphs. We will cover connectivity and uh, spectral sparsification. All right, so without uh, further ado, let's, uh, let's delve into the content. So this lecture will be on the streaming model of computation, so let me define this model for you, so first and formally and then formally. So in the streaming model of computation, what we do is we think of our algorithm as observing a really long stream of data items. And uh, the data items could be anything. For this lecture, they will be numbers for simplicity, but you can think of these data items as IP packets, tweets, search queries, whatever your favorite application is. And our task will be to maintain approximate statistics of the stream. So now the catch, of course, is that we don't have enough memory to store the entire stream, so we're interested in small space algorithms. OK, so more formally, we will be in the following setting. We will think of uh, getting a single pass over n da data items. And uh, these data items are i1, i2, i3 through in. Think of them as numbers, just integers in some poly n bounded range for now. So typically, we will assume that uh, the length of the stream is known to us, although this is not really an issue. All right. So the main point, of course, is that uh, we want to design an algorithm that uh, takes only a single pass over the data stream, and this is because in some applications, for instance, in network monitoring, in traffic monitoring in networks, you can't really expect this traffic to arrive twice. So whenever you saw a data item, if you didn't store some information about it, it's gone. So most of the time we'll be interested in single pass algorithms, and uh, our goal will be to get sublinear storage. So storage will want to be small, and formally we want it to be sublinear, namely if the size of the stream is n, then we want our space complexity to be n to the alpha for some constant alpha less than one, or even better if we can get it, which we will be able to do for certain problems, we want our space complexity to be only polylogarithmic in the length of the stream. So note that this is exponentially smaller than just storing the entire stream. Okay, yes? Can you do something if you don't know? Uh, more often than not, uh, you can do some sort of doubling. So for example, yeah, you, know, you can always count. Yeah. So you wait until you, you think that n is 10, uh, you, you use an algorithm that assumes n is 10, and then once you see that n is more than 5, you double your estimate. Okay, good. So when I say sublinear storage, what exactly do I mean? So what do we measure storage in? Usually we measure it in bits. You can also think of measuring storage in words, uh, where you think that a word is, say, a log n, uh, log n size integer. Uh, or in data items, if you like. Uh, if we talk about graphs, you could think of storing a single edge. Uh, although storing a single edge usually requires only other log n bits. So say up to poly log n factors, this is all the same. Good. So our goal is to get sublinear storage, and we also want fast processing time per element. So as soon as a data item arrives, we want to be able to quickly update our representation. Now, as we will see, most algorithms in this area are randomized, and um, very often randomization is in fact necessary. 
uh, to achieve sublinear storage. So for the problem that we'll discuss today, namely distinct elements, this is indeed the case. Okay, good. So this is the model. Any, any questions about the model? All right. So in this lecture, we'll cover two, two questions, two basic, uh, basic streaming problems. And uh, the first one is distinct elements, namely you're given a long stream of data items and uh, you want to look at the stream at the end of the day, you want to say how many distinct items you saw. So many items may repeat, you want to know how many distinct ones. And we will also look at frequency, moments, uh, frequency moment estimation, namely the AMS sketch for Alon, Matias and Zegri. Okay, good. So the distinct elements problem. So okay, uh, again, so this is our, this is our model. Uh, we get a single pass over the data items, I1, I2 through IN, and uh, now uh, we will think of, uh, actually this, uh, yeah, this shouldn't be N, this should be poly N. So we, 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 we get a single pass over a stream, and uh, think of these numbers as integers between one and N. Our task will be to output the number of distinct elements that we have seen, and we will get an approximate randomized algorithm for this that succeeds with some high constant probability. In terms of the small uh, storage capacity, our algorithm will not store the entire stream, it will only store a polylogarithmic number of bits. And we'll, we'll see how many logs we get. Okay, so let me show you a picture that, that shows what the stream looks like. So here's an example of a stream. So at the bottom we see the data items arriving. So data items uh, 3, 4, 3, 2, and uh, here what we see is a frequency histogram of the stream being updated on the fly. All right, so for example, this I believe is the end of the stream, and uh, the item one arrived twice, so we see two bars. And the item two arrived one, two, three, five times, so we have five bars. Okay, so we'll use this frequency histogram representation uh, very often in this lecture. Good, so our task is to scan the stream and figure out how many distinct elements there are. And uh, well, here the stream is fairly long, but the number of distinct elements in the stream is just eight. The distinct elements are one, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten. Okay, good. So this is just a numerical example, but uh, let me, uh, this may not look sufficiently motivating, let me tell you why we care. And uh, I will first start with a really old motivation for the problem, which comes from the 90s, uh, when uh, it was very interesting to analyze internet traffic. So suppose that uh, the, the, you have a router, and here's a router pictured on the slide, and this router observes network traffic flowing through it. Okay. So a data packet that arrives and goes through the router has uh, two parameters, which is the source and the destination. Well, actually, there's also the, the actual data that it uh, transmits, but we only care, say, about the source and the destination. So one can think of this, uh, and the data items, the packets keep arriving. One can think of this process as updating a traffic matrix for the switch. So you have many, many rows. Uh, the, the rows, uh, that's just the number of source IP addresses in existence. So that's a huge matrix. Uh, the number of rows is about 2 to the 32 or 2 to the 36, so whichever version of IP you want to use. Um, and uh, the columns are to the destinations. So every time a source destination pair arrives, it updates an entry in this matrix. It's an increment to the entry. Okay. And so the question that we want to understand is the following. So you observe, uh, you observe the traffic flowing through the router, and now you want to understand what, what this traffic looks like. In particular, you can definitely count the number of packets that were sent. That is easy. That only takes one counter. But you can't really store the entire traffic because this is a, a router that has very limited me uh, memory. Uh, on the other hand, a very interesting question to answer is the following. Well, uh, given the amount of uh, data that has flown through the, uh, through the router, that is the total number of packets, well, is it true that most of these packets were concentrated on a small number of, uh, a small number of uh, source, IP, uh, source destination pairs, or were they sort of uniformly spread? So, is the traffic mostly contributed by a small number of pairs? So this is exactly the question of estimating the number of IP flows through the router. Namely, we have this huge data matrix. You can think of this as a vector of dimension n, 2 to the 32 by 2 to the 32. Most of it is zeros, of course, but it still has a lot of non-zero entries. We want to know how many distinct entries there are. And here they are. So now the trivial solution would be to store all the distinct source destination pairs. That's way too much memory. We can't do this. 
to a space complexity of that would be theta n, where theta n is the number of pairs. So what we will see in this lecture is a randomized algorithm that will approximately compute uh, the number of distinct, distinct entries in such a stream of data items using space substantially smaller than the universe size. Namely, the space will be polylogarithmic. It will be something like log to the 3 of n. So that's an exponential improvement uh, over the trivial solution. All right, so this is the first motivation. Uh, if you don't like motivations from the 90s, let me give you a modern one. Uh, and uh, the modern one is, uh, is the following. Suppose that your data stream is, is, uh, is queries on google.com over a period of time. So for instance, here's my, a few queries from me uh, looking for a flight from Geneva to New York, maybe getting tired of this process, uh, going for coffee, and then looking for flights again. Well, so this is a data stream of size three, and uh, the number of distinct items is two. That's easy to compute. But uh, now if you think of a stream of data, a stream of queries on google.com over a period of time, uh, this is a huge stream, and this is a hard, hard question to, to answer. OK, so the trivial question, the trivial solution to this question would be to just hash the entire data stream of items, just as before. And so we would incur space cost proportional to the number of distinct items in the set. This is prohibitively expensive. Now, solutions designed for the streaming model of computation provide uh, very good bounds. For example, uh, I will not talk about this algorithm, but this is known as hyperlog log, -log uh, which uh, show, solves the problem in uh, space, proportion, uh, space bounded by a polylog in, uh, the, in the universe size. Uh, furthermore, this solution is actually widely used in practice uh, for estimating the number of queries on google.com over a period of time. Okay, well, at this point, if, if I claim that there is a small space solution that runs in, in space polylogarithmic uh, in, the, in the number of, um, in the number of uh, data items, the natural question is, well, this may be a constant power of a log, but a log is a constant, so how good is this in practice? Well, there are practical versions of these schemes that achieve really good performance in, in, real, in real life. And they're widely used for scalable data, uh, data analytics. So for example, exactly for this question of uh, uh, estimating how many distinct queries you have over a period of time in a large database. OK, good. So let's uh, get to the actual problem and uh, our solution. So we have a sequence of, uh, uh, we have a single pass over a stream of data items. And what we want is a small space algorithm that will output a one plus minus epsilon approximation to the number of distinct elements that we have seen in the stream. So this is the formal uh, guarantee. So if we denote the number of distinct elements by DE, then we want to output some DE hat, which is multiplicatively sandwiched between a one minus epsilon DE and, plus, uh, and one plus epsilon DE. So think of epsilon as uh, say one tenth, so we want a 90% approximation to the number of distinct elements. Okay. Good. So for constant epsilon, we will get polylogarithmic space bound. Now these algorithms uh, have to be uh, randomized, as, as, I, as I said before, and uh, we will get a solution that succeeds on every fixed stream of data items with probability at least one minus delta, where delta is some parameter. And uh, even if delta is small, uh, the space bound will not be affected too much. So we'll have good dependence on the failure probability. Yes. So is your data random, so to say, or do you have an adversary generating the data? Great question. The question was, uh, is the uh, what is the the question was about the model? So are we assuming that the uh, that um, are we assuming that uh, the data stream is generated by some specific random process, or is the algorithm applicable to worst case instances, and does it work for them? Uh, the answer is the second. So we don't have make any assumptions on the data, uh, and uh, uh, we don't make any assumptions on the data. So for the guarantee is that for every fixed data set, our algorithm is randomized, it flips some coins, and with probability at least one minus delta, say 99% probability, uh, it gives the answer that satisfies the multiplicative guarantee. Any other questions about the model? Is there the given? Uh... Oh, good. The, uh, 
the question is uh, whether or not delta is given. Uh, delta is a design choice. So if you want a reliable algorithm, then you set delta equals uh, whatever you like, say 0.01, and uh, delta will actually go into the space bound. So this log to the constant of n assumes that delta is, uh, say, at least 1 over poly n. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, good. All right, good. So before we solve this problem, though, uh, I would like to concentrate on a substantially easier question. And the easier question is this. Now, suppose that I'm not just asked to approximate the number of distinct elements, but I'm also given a, given a threshold. I don't want to know a number, which is how many elements have I seen, but I'm also given a threshold t, and I want to design an algorithm ELG that succeeds with high probability and distinguishes between two cases. In the yes case, the number of distinct elements in the stream is substantially higher than the threshold. So at least 1 plus epsilon times t. So think of epsilon as 0.1. I want to get a 90% approximation to the number of distinct elements. So here, just suppose I want, to say, I want to say yes if I see a lot of distinct elements, and a lot is at least 1 plus epsilon t. And I want to say no if the number of distinct elements is substantially below my threshold, 1 minus epsilon times t. So note the important part is that there is a gap between when I definitely say yes and when, uh, with high probability say yes, with high probability say no, and in between I'm free to do whatever I like. Okay, well, we will concentrate on this goal. But note that if we're able to solve this simpler problem with a, with a threshold, that is, uh, we can think of this as a decision version of our problem, then we can get a multiplicative approximation to the number of distinct elements in the stream simply by taking this algorithm, this will be a small space streaming algorithm, and we will run in parallel the streaming algorithm on a geometric sequence of thresholds. So t equals 1, 1 plus epsilon, 1 plus epsilon squared, all the way through n. This will worsen the uh, total space a bit, and this will worsen the, uh, the success probability. But we're not trying to optimize the log factors on this, so we'll be fine. OK. Good. So it will be convenient, to, in order to describe the algorithm, uh, to use a, sort of a slight formalization of this frequency histogram. And all I want to say is that I want to introduce the notation for the frequency histogram. So suppose that our items come from a universe of size n, uh, and uh, let x here, x and rn, be the histogram of the stream. So initially, x is 0. And then if an item i gets inserted in the stream, then we can think of this insertion as just uh, an increase uh, on the ith coordinate of x. So it's the same picture as before. But uh, we, we now have notation. So the frequency histogram is x. And we want to, to estimate the number of uh, distinct elements in x. This is the same as the number of non-zeros in the vector x. Could you have my... Okay. <laughs> so n, uh, uh, n is, an, is the size of the universe, right? Yes, n is the size of the universe. It's not the number of elements in the stream. So there was a typo before, if that's confusing. But on the, on the previous slide, you... On the previous slide, it is still the size of the universe here. Yeah. Yes, it is the size of the universe. It is the size. I think in the first slide, right. you defined it as the size of the stream. Yes, yes. So this is a typo. The size of the stream is some poly n. Yeah. I have an up about on the coming values. On the what? On the coming values. Oh, say again? You have an upper bound for the coming values. Like you get one, you get three, four, three. You have upper bound for the values. That's n. Upper bound for the values. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Oh, the yeah, that's n. So basically, uh, sort of the numbers that are coming are between one and n, All right? Good. Yeah, good. So the numbers that are coming are between one and n. So the the largest possible number of distinct elements that we may see is n. Uh, now the length of the stream, assume it's poly n. So let's you know it's not too large as a function of the universe size. Good. Um, did I describe an algorithm yet? Which one? Uh huh. So it's 
it's not an algorithm. It's not an algorithm. No, no, good. So this is just I'm defining what x is. I want to introduce an x. And x is the frequency histogram. So we'll, we've seen the frequency histogram before. Now I'm just calling it x. Good. So the frequency histogram has uh, n, uh, n points, uh, is indexed by n things, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, blah, 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 through n. Uh, and uh, x is just the number of times, x sub i is the number of times element i occurred. So this space, space. Oh, I see. If you, good. Yeah. So if you were to just write down x explicitly, this would take linear space. And we want to do better than that. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? All right, good, good. So initially x is zero, so then for example, if three arrives, uh, we think of three as just an increment, uh, increment x three by one. And four arrives, et cetera, et cetera. So some elements, like three at the moment, arrive four times, and this proceeds. Good. So now we have notation, which is very useful. So our task is to approximate the number of distinct elements in the stream, which is the exact same thing as the number of non-zero entries in the vector x. OK, now what is the algorithm? So recall that we're trying to solve this simple problem now. Namely, we are given the stream and a threshold t. We want to know if the number of distinct elements, or non-zeros in x, is a little bit above t, or at least non-trivially below t. Here's what we do. We choose a, sort of the idea is to do random sampling. So if you imagine this, uh, this x, and if we were to store the entire vector x, this would take linear space. What we will do, though, is, is the following. So imagine that x has a number of non-zero entries. We will choose a random set, a random subset of the universe, of, uh, and, and each element of the universe will belong to s with probability 1 over t independently. This is our threshold. And what we will show is that the number, if the number of elements was substantially higher than t, then we're just likely to hit one of them with this s. So then it suffices to maintain a counter that just counts, oh, how many elements from s have I seen? And this will be the entire algorithm. So instead of uh, storing the entire x, we'll use a sequence of geometric subsamplings of the universe and store a counter on every such, universe, uh, every such subsampling. All right, good. So in this particular case, so suppose my t was maybe about one quarter or so. I had a universe of size 10. I sampled, uh, I, I flipped some coins, and the set S ended up being the number 3 and the number 6. So these are marked as red on the slide. Good. So now what is the algorithm? Uh, the algorithm now is very simple. We just maintain a single counter. Let me call the counter C. The counter depends on S. So C sub S is simply the sum over all elements i and s of x i. Uh, yeah. You were just saying that the s, the size of s is n over t. Is that, uh, right? that is correct. So the expected size of s will be n over t. Okay. Uh, so s, uh, the size of s is also not really determined. It's random by those. Good. Yes, exactly. So s is a random subset. So S, the distribution of S is this. You look at every element in, in the universe, flip a coin independently with probability 1 over t, it's in the set, uh, and otherwise it's not. So the expected size of the set will be a 1 over t fraction of the universe. The distribution is some binomial, uh, some binomial distribution. Yeah. It's pretty concentrated. It's yeah. Good. Any other questions? The number of distinct elements are, if you want the uh, logarithmic range time, then you are assuming that uh, t is kind of logarithmic inside of n. Inside of the uh, why? So, so the number of, so if finally you want to count the number of distinct elements yes. in s. Yes. So uh, no, 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 no. All I will want to do is I will just maintain a counter, C sub S, uh, and uh, I will just, uh, yeah, it's just a sum. Yeah, good. So let me tell you how we use the, the estimator. So, so the only thing that we maintain is, uh, is this counter. And the estimation is like this. Uh, if, if, uh, if, if the counter is positive, then we output yes meaning that uh, the number of distinct elements was probably larger than t. And if the counter is zero, then we say no. The number of distinct elements was probably smaller than t. There was a question? Uh, 
Yeah, why do we compute the solution uh, to uh, this uh, set? Uh, randomly, why don't we do this uh, for this thing? Can you repeat? Um, yeah, we have a set test. So why don't so why we uh, use randomness to compute uh, if the element belongs to the set? Why don't we uh, do this deterministically? I see. The question was, uh, why do we use randomness to, to figure out whether or not an element is in the set? We'll use this in an analysis at the moment. So think of this as follows. You, we first uh, sit down, uh, and for each, uh, for each element of the universe, flip a coin to figure out if it's in the set. And then we store this set explicitly. The set is actually pretty big. For example, if t is, say, one-tenth, uh, then the set is, 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 is one-tenth fraction of the universe. I'll tell you later how to avoid storing the set. So think of the set S as given. We'll use the randomness in a second for the analysis. OK, good. And so this is the estimator. So we maintain, uh, we basically maintain the sum of the elements of x over some random subset S. And that's it. If the sum is positive, we say yes. Otherwise, we say no. Good. OK, so now let's, uh, let me give you the analysis. So why does that work? Um, so this is the algorithm again. And this is, uh, recall this is the algorithm for the decision problem. So we want to show that if the number of distinct elements is larger than 1 plus epsilon times t, then we mostly say yes. And if the number of distinct elements is smaller than 1 minus epsilon times t, then we mostly say no. OK. Um, well, I want to assume for simplicity, and uh, you know, the analysis is the same for, uh, without this assumption, if t is, suppose that t is large enough, so this threshold t is large enough, this will simplify the math, but the algorithm works, uh, works just like this. If t is large enough, then I claim that the probability of a counter, uh, the, 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 that our counter, cs, is zero, is, uh, has a reasonably, reasonably simple form. It's basically e to the number of uh, distinct elements divided by t. Well, why? Because, you know, imagine the distinct elements of x. Uh, what is the probability that the counter is zero? Well, this only happens if none of the elements is picked. So that's 1 minus 1 over t raised to power the number of distinct elements. So this is, if t is large enough, this is e to the minus number of distinct elements divided by t. OK. So now. Suppose that the number of distinct elements is bigger than 1 plus epsilon times t. Then the probability that we see a 0 is roughly the number of distinct elements divided by t. So there's a typo here. It should be e to the minus dE by t. So if the number of distinct elements is bigger than 1 plus epsilon t, then the probability of seeing a 0 is roughly e to the, is at most, e to the minus 1 plus epsilon. Right, because we had e to the minus ep, uh, distinct elements divided by t, uh, which is at most 1 plus epsilon t over t. So that's e to the minus 1 plus epsilon. And so this is smaller than e to the minus 1 minus about epsilon. On the other hand, if the number of distinct elements was below 1 minus epsilon times t, then the probability of seeing a 0 is e to the minus 1 minus epsilon. Well, that's about 1, minus, uh, 1 over e plus epsilon. So there is a gap. So if the number of distinct elements was large, then the probability of seeing a 0 is, uh, is uh, small, is uh, 1, over ep 1 over e minus epsilon by 3. If the number of distinct elements was small, then the probability of seeing a zero is actually large. And this makes sense, because what we're doing is we have a number of distinct elements. We're, set, we're choosing a subset, t, a subset uniformly at random. And naturally, uh, if, the, uh, if the number of distinct elements was small, then it's pretty unlikely that we hit it. If it was large, then we likely hit it. If it was small, it's unlikely that we hit it. So formally, there is a gap. The gap is not very large, though. 
So note that the gap is only uh, additive epsilon in probability. Any questions? Yeah. What happens if you choose some other value for CS? Yes, because like if you have just one guy appearing there, then okay, then your algorithm is going to say yes. Uh -huh. But if the number of guys that you might have in S might be way too large, so to say. So you're saying yes when it's not really Oh, I see. So you're saying that, I see. So are you saying that this algorithm looks a little bit insensitive in the sense that CS might be bigger than zero just because of one element that got into the sample, or there could be a thousand elements that got into the sample? I see. Good. But this is exactly, uh, this is exactly what uh, is handled by the fact that later on, uh, we will uh, take uh, copies of this algorithm for various uh, sampling rates. So basically, if you're, you know, if 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 uh, if for this particular value t, you're saying uh, yes because you just catch one element, uh, then for a larger t, so, uh, then if you're saying yes that because you catch one element, then you'll basically report that number. But then if you're saying yes because you catch many many elements, then for a larger value of t, you will catch about one, so it will be reported correctly. Yeah, this is a good. Ah, good. So this is uh, x sub i is just the number of times element i occurred in the stream. So x sub three in this case is one, two, three, four, five, six, because three occurred. Um, one needs to count, but six times one. Yes. Okay. What would happen if, like, for uh, t you say is it yes, it's hit, but for a bigger set you said no, it doesn't. Mm, I see. The question is what? Uh, yeah, we'll handle this in a bit. Yeah, for the the question of how you combine different t's, we'll handle it in a little bit. So is the constant, or it might be some log factor or so? Say again. T is constant. Oh, so it's just large enough. This is the large enough constant here. Good. Okay, so here's the summary. So we have a basic version of our algorithm that does the following. Uh, if the number of distinct elements is, is 1 plus epsilon higher than the threshold, uh, then uh, the probability of saying, uh, saying no is smaller than 1 over e minus epsilon. And because we say no when the counter is 0. If the number of distinct elements is substantially below the threshold, then the probability of saying no is non-trivially above. Uh, 1 over e. So as is, this algorithm is not particularly exciting because it, so to speak, it gives you the correct answer with probability uh, at most epsilon. It does give some, some information, but only epsilon. So we need to boost it. And uh, we boost it by independent repetition. The full algorithm is as follows. So instead of choosing one subset s, we choose a number of subsets, s1 through sk, for k that we will we'll, we'll select, but k will be not too large. It will be 1 over epsilon squared times log of uh, the inverse of failure probability. We'll do this in a second. Right. What we'll do is well, we, we just repeat this, in, this experiment independently k times. So we, this means that we will maintain counters c sub sj for j and k. So each counter takes one word of storage, so we'll get, uh, this will worsen the, the, the space complexity. Yes. So S actually, the sets? The sets, uh, good. The question was, do we store the sets S? Let me delay this question. Uh, I'll answer it uh, in, in a couple of slides. Yeah. We, we don't, because otherwise it would be bad. <laughs> good. Uh, so, good. So we maintain these counters, and now our estimator is as follows. So let z be the number of, uh, number of counters that turned out to be zero. Then we look at the number of, uh, we look at the fraction of counters that turned out to be zero, and if this fraction was strictly less than 1 over e, we say yes. It was, if it was strictly, if it was at least k over e, then we say no. All right. We will show that this algorithm actually succeeds with 1 minus delta probability. Here's a note that the relation is this. So the basic algorithm was just, uh, for the basic algorithm, we had this property that if the right answer is yes, uh, then the counter is 0 with a small probability. 
at least epsilon below 1 over e. And so what this is saying is just do many, many experiments and look at the empirical frequency. Uh, and if it's, uh, if it's less than k over e, then say yes. Okay, so I need to argue about space complexity and correctness. Uh, let's start with space complexity. And spa space complexity is this. Um, well, uh, for the decision problem, what did we do? Uh, well, we just repeated 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over delta times. And each counter is a number in poly n range. Uh, and for the estimation problem, it's the same thing multiplied by log of n base 1 plus epsilon. So that's 1 over epsilon times log n. So for the estimation problem, we get 1 over epsilon squared times log n times log 1 over delta poly n bounded numbers. Uh, and uh, the note, that, uh, note that this repetition also goes into the failure probability, oh, but it's, it's not a particularly big deal. Yes? Why do we get one over epsilon q for estimation? Uh, we do. Oh, so it's a function. Yes. <laughs> good. All right. Good. So now let's, uh, let's, uh, let's reason about correctness. And correctness follows from the Chernoff bound. Because remember, uh, what we did was uh, we basically performed independent experiments, and we performed uh, 1 over epsilon squared times log 1 over delta of them. Well, uh, we want to show that uh, we want to show that uh, that uh, that it works well. So let me just state the Chernoff bound and uh, say that it works by the Chernoff bound. So the Chernoff bound says the following. So suppose that we have IID Bernoulli random variables, Z1 through Zn, and uh, say the expectation of Zi is P. So think of, uh, in our application, this Zi is the indicator random variable of the event that the ith repetition, the ith parallel repetition of our simple algorithm said uh, yes. Uh, and so let z be the sum of zi's. Well, what the Chernoff bound says is that the probability that we have, uh, that the probability that the sum deviates from its expectation by an, at least an epsilon fraction of the expectation is uh, at most, uh, is, is exponentially small. It's exponentially small in epsilon squared times the expectation itself. And this is exactly the reason why we needed to repeat uh, the procedure 1 over epsilon squared times. Right, because recall that here we have a gap between the frequencies, which is about epsilon. So repeating the procedure 1 over epsilon squared times, 1 over epsilon squared times log 1 over delta times allows us to reduce the failure probability to, to delta. Yes? Why do you have an end in Yeah, we shouldn't have an end. Uh, it, it should be Z1. Yeah, it should be sort of Z1. Okay, good. So now let me tell you about the choice of S. So there's a question saying, how do we, do we store S? So how do we store these subsets S? Uh, the answer is we, we don't. But uh, in general, how do we implement a, a set S? Well, one way to do this is to choose a hash function H that maps our universe of size N to numbers between one, uh, 1 and T. Remember, we wanted to sample at rate 1 over T. And then we let s be exactly those uh, elements i in the universe that hash the number 1. So now for each element, the probability of being an s is exactly 1 over t, as we wanted. Does anyone see a problem with this? It's basically the hash. Excellent. How do we store h? Uh, and uh, indeed, if the h is uh, a fully independent hash function, then that's the same, same space complexity as storing the set s explicitly, or even worse, actually. Uh, so there are several, uh, several approaches. One can either use a pseudorandom number generator, and one example is Nissan's uh, PRG, uh, which uh, can be used to make the following statement, that if we have a linear sketching algorithm that uses an amount of space s and uses independent randomness, then one can always replace this independent randomness with a specific pseudorandom number generator uh, that will worsen our space bounds by a log n factor. But uh, it can definitely still be used to recover the uh, poly log n bound. One other option is to redo analysis. And this particular analysis will not go through. But uh, one can redo the analysis with slight modifications uh, for a simpler family of functions h. And in particular, uh, for families H that are, that are pairwise independent. So you don't uh, want full independence, but for any two points, the probability of should be uniform. 
Okay, and that's uh, and such functions can be stored with uh, a logarithmic number of bits. Okay, any any questions on this? Okay, good. So let, let me summarize. So one interesting point is that. Uh, we designed an algorithm that looks like a linear sketch, and we will do, we'll design more algorithms of this type in the next few lectures. So we're thinking of our input, the stream, as a frequency histogram X, and our algorithm just samples a random matrix S. Do not confuse this with the set S. Uh, samples some kind of a random matrix, and we just maintain matrix vector product, S times X. S is, uh, has N rows. Uh, and columns, because otherwise we can't quite multiply. Uh, and it has a small number of rows, little m. So in our example, little m was 1 over epsilon cubed, log squared, and log 1 over delta. So we store just the right-hand side b. And at the end of the day, we show that if you look at this right-hand side at the matrix vector product, you can uncover a good approximation to the, distinct, uh, to the number of distinct elements from this right-hand side. So can somebody tell me, what are the, what are the rows of this matrix? for our solution. Sorry, could you repeat what is X? Oh, okay, so uh, maybe the notation is not entirely perfect because we had, the, the, we had these sets, these random sets that we sampled. And I'm claiming that uh, the algorithm that we just designed can be, fr can be viewed as a linear sketch. So it, it acts linearly. Sort of the, the representation of X that we have is linear. M namely, we just designed some matrix and what we're storing is S times that matrix. All right, and why is that? Uh, this is because one row of this matrix, remember we're just, uh, we're just storing the sum of X over subsets. That's a dot product of X with, a ran with an indicator vector of a random set. So the rows of this, X, of this set, uh, set S are just uh, random zero, one vectors with various densities. Hmm? The yes, it's, it's a random zero one matrix, but the density, uh, the probability of having a one or a zero, uh, it, it, uh, it's different for different rows, right? Because we had this uh, log of n base one over epsilon uh, levels. Okay. Yes, so could you tell again? So each row of this matrix <coughs> corresponds to. Uh -huh. So each. It's okay. Can we probably go back to the slide where you show uh, the <coughs> So this is probably where we want to get back to. Uh, and there's a slight uh, mismatch in notation. So this S is not that S. Right. All right. So note that what we're doing here is uh, we. Uh, so what we're maintaining is just one counter, which is the sum of the values of x over a subset of coordinates. You can write this equivalently as. Uh, the indicator of the set transpose x, right? right. And uh, all and you know, and later we had a bunch of these sets. We had s i's, right? Because first we needed to do some independent repetition. So here we had s one through s k. Right. So we had a bunch of these sets. Uh, and uh, later we also needed to change the density. So like these particular s i's, where every element was in with probability one over t. But then there's a logarithmic. Uh, scale. Uh, there, there's sort of a logarithmic number of various t's. So you can just stack them all into a matrix. So say this is say t equals uh, 2, t equals, actually t equals 1, t equals 1 plus epsilon, etc. Right, so all in all, we're just com we're storing dot products. And we're storing a bunch of dot products of x with randomly selected, uh, with random vectors from appropriate distributions. So this can be viewed as a uh, matrix, vector, matrix vector product for some matrices. So in particular, what this means is that uh, our algorithm is more general than what we wanted. If elements don't just, uh, don't just arrive in the stream, but they also depart, that is, there are deletions, we can also handle that as well. Because after all, the scheme is linear. So if, uh, if in the stream we have an item i deleted, well, it's just, that's just a decrement to the ith position of x. And so as long as uh, at the end of the stream, no, item, no, no data item was deleted that was never present before, we're fine. The algorithm works. OK, good, good. So 
so this is just one way of getting polylogarithmic space complexity. Uh, it is known how to get an optimal space complexity. This is the work of Kane, Nelson, and Woodruff. This gets uh, 1 over epsilon squared plus auto log n bit, and this is optimal to within constant factors. Uh, there are also practical developments. So this algorithm is great, but it's not entirely practical. There are also practical versions of, versions of this. For instance, the uh, hyperlog log of uh, Duran and Flagellet. And uh, this has been implemented in practice and sort of fine-tuned. For example, by this paper. How would it come the practical version before theoretical? Say it again? How it comes the practical version before theoretical? Uh, <clears throat> no, no, but this, this is a theoretical, uh, sure, good. Uh, so th this algorithm uh, has nice theoretical bounds, but these are stronger. Yeah. Uh, so these are typed to within constant factors, but this one with slightly suboptimal the theoretical bounds turns out to be practical. Makes sense. So maybe, yes. you also go, go back one slide? So do you understand correctly that, yeah, so you were storing some counter, but mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the day you were just using whether it is greater than zero or not. Correct. Right? Which means that you can just store one bit. But <coughs> you were storing numbers exactly to be able to subtract. Yes, excellent, excellent question. The question was, uh, at, when we started, we're thinking of an insertion stream, so items are only added. And the only thing we, we cared about is whether or not the counter is zero or not. So you don't have to make it a, a poly and a bounded number. You can just store one bit, as Sasha is saying. But uh, if you want to also handle deletions, that's when you need a poly and bounded number. Yeah, good. Any other questions? Okay, good. So I don't have that much time, uh, but perhaps I will start. Uh, I will start the AMS sketch, and uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So, la so generally, later later in this week, uh, I will talk about more algorithms of the sketching framework. So we'll design different matrices S such that if you maintain S times X, then uh, and S has a small number of rows. At the end of the day, you can look at the right hand side and uh, unpack uh, some interesting information about X from the right hand side. So we'll talk about more basic statistics of data streams, and then we'll talk about uh, sketching graphs. OK, so note that at this point, what we did was design an algorithm for the, for the distinct elements. And that is basically the same question as uh, approximating the L0 norm of a vector x. It's not quite a norm, but uh, it, it, it is well defined. <coughs> so the natural question is, what about other values of p? So can we approximate uh, p norms of vectors in the data streaming model? So for instance, two extreme cases are the L infinity norm, which is just the maximum value of, uh, of the vector, and uh, the zero norm, which is the distinct number of distinct elements. So we have uh, a result for L0, but we don't have one for L infinity yet. Uh, so related question is frequency moments, which is the same as uh, LP norm to the p. Can we approximate the pth frequency moment? And uh, so we'll not talk about this uh, much, except for p equals 2. But let me just tell you that uh, here, this problem exhibits a very interesting dichotomy. If p is less than, uh, less than uh, 0, uh, less than 2, uh, then a polylogarithmic space algorithm, at least for constant epsilon and actually for, uh, for, for any epsilon with 1 over epsilon squared dependence or so exists. Uh, on the other hand, if, p's, if p is greater than 2, so if you want to sketch anything higher than the L2 norm, the Euclidean norm, uh, then uh, you need at least polynomial space. And uh, the proofs are extremely interesting uh, via very nice information theory. I will not talk about this, though. OK, so what I will definitely talk about, though, is uh, the L2 norm. So now let me talk a little bit about <coughs> sketching frequency moments, and in particular for p equals 2. And the question is this. So now we have uh, data items arriving in the stream. We think of x as this frequency histogram. What we want to understand is uh, what is the L2 norm of the frequency vector, so the second frequency moment. Oh, why do we care? One can think, for instance, of uh, these uh, applications in uh, network uh, traffic monitoring, where, again, if, if there is a denial of service attacks, this means that, uh, often means that a lot of traffic is concentrated on a small number of IP addresses. And uh, if you can approximate the L2 norm, this is uh, an indicator of uh, what your X looks like, of what is the shape of your distribution. Okay. And uh, the way we'll do it 
is uh, quite related to what Ilya discussed in his lecture. Um, and in particular, the solution will be as follows. This is known as Alon, Matthias, and Zegedi sketch from 96, something that, uh, in a sense, started streaming as an area. The solution is the following. So let's uh, choose n uh, random variables, r1 through rn. Remember, our universe is of size n. Each random variable is <coughs> independently plus minus 1. It's a random sign. And uh, the way we will, uh, our streaming algorithm, again, will be a linear sketch. So we'll store a linear function of x. <coughs> we'll store z, which is the sum over all i from 1 to n, of ri times xi. So as before, we're summing up the entries of x, but we're summing up all of them and with random signs. Good, so that's what we maintain. Now what do we output? What's the estimate? The estimate is simple, we just output z squared. Okay, so we'll, we'll try to see, we'll try to claim that this works. It doesn't quite work, but we'll see why it doesn't and we'll fix it. Okay, so we're trying to design a randomized estimator for the L2 norm squared of x. How do we prove that uh, and we have this candidate random variable, z squared, uh, that supposedly is close to our true answer, the L2 norm squared of x, with high probability? How do you prove this? Well, usually the way you prove this is uh, you look at this random variable. Well, first we want to compute that at least the mean is correct. That is, the estimator is unbiased. And if the mean is correct, uh, then we go and compute the variance <coughs> and show that not only are we correct in expectation, but we're actually correct most of the time. That's what makes an estimator useful. So let's compute the, let's compute the mean, the expectation. The computation is, is on the slide. It's, it's not a very complicated computation. So we want the expectation of z squared. Well, what is z squared? Uh, well, that's just the sum of ri xi, the entire sum squared. And the expectation is with respect to the random signs. Well, let's open up the sum. We get a double summation over all i and j from 1 to n. We want the expectation of ri times rj times xi times xj. So the random variables here are the ri's, the xj's are just numbers, so they could definitely be pulled out of the sum. So what we're interested in is just the expectation of ri times uh, rj. Now what is that? Uh, well, ri and rj are independent random signs. So if i is different from j, we can split the, this is just a product of expectations. And so we'll split this double sum into a summation over i equals to j, so we get x, xi squared, because ri squared is 1. Uh, and uh, then all, all the off-diagonal terms. All the off-diagonal terms, well, what do we have there? Well, we have the expectation of ri times ij. Uh, those were independent. That's the product of expectations. But those are random signs, so their expectation is zero. So the estimator is unbiased. Good. Now, uh, this is reassuring. So let's see, <coughs> can we prove that the estimator is actually close to the expectation. So for that, uh, we will need, uh, we need to bound the variance. And the variance of z squared is the expectation of z to the 4 uh, minus the expectation of z squared squared. So let's upper bound that. Um, by the way, are there any questions on the, on the previous calculation? OK, good. So let's upper bound the variance. Yes. Discussing here, so uh, mm -hmm. probably you go back on slide. Okay, good. Um, I see. No, even, even, e even more. Okay. Even more, right? right. So, so the setting here is that we don't. Uh, I mean, the algorithm works as follows: when when element i arrives, you just you just take it with the sign r i. So yeah, great. We uh -huh. don't know x i, right? Yeah, good, good, good. We don't know x i. Excellent. Yeah. This is not something that we can use. We maintain. Yeah. Right. That's why it says maintain, right? Because <laughs> sort of, uh, good, good, good. So we maintain means that sort of originally x is 0. So we initialize z to 0. Yeah. And then items arrive or depart. So if we see an arrival of item i, then we say, OK, uh, I need to update my z. How do you update the z? Well, you look at what ri was, and you just add the sign ri to your current value of z. Good. Yeah, yeah. Then if an item i departs, so you see minus i in the stream, say delete i, 
And I'll say, all right, so let me update my z. I'll just subtract ri from the estimator. Good. Thank you. Any other questions on this uh, on the setting? And here is a, is a number of oh. Is the universe size? Is the universe size? Yeah. So n is the universe size. Yeah. And we start out at zero. And yeah. Where, where, by the way, do you use the fact that this the size of this stream is only polynomial to n? Um, uh, because uh, I I want to be able to at least. Um, uh, store the z. Okay. So at the end of the day, I will say something like, "Oh, and storing z takes order log n bits." Yeah, yeah, good. Any other questions on the on the setup? I think I'm running out of time. I I don't have any more. Um, yeah, maybe I have a couple of minutes, right? Uh, so let me then take a couple of minutes and uh, just go over the expectation calculation, and we'll do the variance part uh, in the next lecture. Okay, good. So this is our estimator. So now we want to prove that this uh, z squared is close to uh, L2 norm of x squared with high probability. The first thing we want to do is uh, compute the expectation. All right. Uh, and uh, well, you just compute it. So we, uh, we look at uh, z squared, we write it as a double summation. All the cross terms vanish because, uh, because the signs are independent. And uh, we are left with only the diagonal terms, which is the L2 norm squared of x. OK, so the estimator is unbiased. Then we look at the variance. And perhaps we'll just look at the variance uh, in the next lecture. The variance computation is uh, a little bit more complicated. We just look at what the fourth moment of z is. So that's a fourfold sum. We need to understand a little bit better uh, what, the, what types of terms, what types of cross terms arise there. But it turns out that there are basically <coughs> only two types of terms that contribute non-zero amounts. So those that are truly diagonal, namely uh, four copies of the same element, and those that have two pairs of distinct elements, i and j. Uh, the, because those terms that have uh, an occurrence of a single uh, xi, they, uh, <coughs> uh, they, they vanish in expectation because the corresponding sign occurs with an odd power. Okay, good. Good. And uh, then we'll finish the analysis of uh, this estimator and uh, talk about other topics in the uh, next lecture.